So I did a lot of work. I didn't become an official business with my art until 2001. Okay. Where uh, I actually thought, okay, I'm going to. I'm going to have this as a side business. It, yeah. It's tough. Yes. <laughs> it's a tough gig. Yeah. But I still love painting, and coming to Kameno was really a good fit for me, mm-hmm. knowing that there were so many artists, and I've loved that. Yeah. Every second of that part. Hey, Islanders, and welcome to episode 176 of the Kameno Voice. Today, I speak with the executive director of the Kameno Center, Please welcome Bonnie Eckley. Hi, I'm Brandon Erickson, and you're listening to the Kameno Voice Podcast, where I interview local business owners, comedians, singers, and more. I dive into their backstory to find out how they got where they are, what are some of the tips for you to do the same, and find out where they are going. Tune in every week as I interview more of the people you see every day. Hey, Islanders, and welcome to another episode of the Camino Voice, where we release a new episode every Tuesday. And uh, hey, before we get into this episode, I want to do a quick shout out to a previous podcast guest that I had on this podcast uh, in episode 146. Uh, I think 146. Um, but it's uh, Courtney Borisa, who is the owner of Rainbow Eats, um, has just opened up a new brick and mortar location in Mount Vernon. Uh, so it's right across from the co-op. It's called the Skagit Table. And uh, I have a link to the website, to the, her website uh, below, and a link to uh, her podcast interview if you haven't listened to that. Um, but uh, I got to visit that this weekend, and basically what they do is uh, she makes uh, ready-to-go meals. Um, so if you want to just stop by there, pick up a meal for home, uh, then you get that homemade um, feel uh, without having to do all the work for the homemade meal. <laughs> um, so it's it's pretty great. And um, so we actually have gotten a few different things from her over the weekend um, or over this last week when they opened. Um, we had the uh, stroganoff. I believe that's what it was, uh, the noodles and stroganoff. And that was uh, really good. And, um, and then there was uh, like a, a beef over, I think it was cauliflower rice, uh, broccoli beef. Um, also very good. So those were two of the things that we got from them that were uh, just very, very enjoyable. Um, so be sure to stop by her new place. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited for, for new businesses. I'm always excited for new businesses. Small business um, just always excites me. Um, it always is exciting to see someone's dream kind of come to fruition. So uh, anyways, again, that was the Skagit table in Mount Vernon across from the co-op. Um, so if you're ever in Mount Vernon, Stop by, pick up some food for dinner, and uh, you won't be disappointed. All right, on to the episode. All right, so uh, like normal, I hope you guys had a good weekend. Um, It was a little bit rainy, but I was still able to get the lawn mowed before all of that, so that was good. Um, (laughs) But um, today I interview Bonnie Eckley, um, and many of you may know her um, from the Commando Center. Uh, She's been the executive director there, um, I think, since 2018. I might be off on that. But basically, she took over just a little bit before COVID and everything that happened through that. And uh, when she took over the Camino Center, there was a lot going on, and it wasn't doing super well uh, on its finances, and there were some other uh, issues and stuff like that. And Bonnie really stepped in and, and took ownership of all the different pieces of it. Uh, And then, as weird as it is, COVID ended up being kind of a reset for them. And and in this case, it ended up being a positive reset. Uh, They were able to really reanalyze everything they were doing and say, okay, is this really what our mission is? What is our mission here in the community? And uh, she articulates that very well throughout this podcast. Um, And then she talks about a lot of the programs that they've brought on since COVID. You know, some of the old ones that they've brought back. But certain ones that they've kind of decided to move on or, or hand off to somebody else. Um, there's a lot of great organizations in this area. Um, we we talk about like the Camino Resource Center and stuff, who, who is somewhere you can reach out to if you're you're wanting to know what can we do in the area. What are how do I get involved in the area? They're a great place to do that. Um, that's the Camino Resource Center. So I'll also link them in the show notes. But. Um, yeah, so just working together, all the nonprofits in the area working together to figure out how do we move the community forward so that we're not stepping on each other's toes, but we're all uh, like experts and 
staying in our lane in the sense that we can do our lane better than anyone else. Um, and so that's really what they focused on. And so they've continued to add programs for the older adults, as they are called, uh, not seniors. We're trying to move away from that term uh, she, Bonnie was mentioning. So uh, I'm trying to do my best in the intro. Um, so anyways, uh, we're going to get into all of that and more. We also get a little bit into uh, Bonnie's um, art background and just how she has enjoyed doing that. Um, and so um, we do touch on that briefly, but a lot of the focus on Camino Center and all the things going on there. So uh, without further ado, here's my conversation with Bonnie Eckley. Hey, Islanders, and welcome to another episode of the Camino Voice. Today, I'm here with the executive director of the Camino C- Center. Welcome to the podcast, Bonnie Eckley. Hi. Hi. Thank you. So before we get started, tell us a little bit about Bonnie. Well, I grew up in Marysville, Washington, okay. not too far from here. Yeah. Moved here four years ago with my husband and dogs, and at the time, adult son, but he has since moved to Colorado, so... I uh, worked in healthcare for 30 years okay. at the Everett Clinic, and once that merger kind of happened, uh, things changed quite a bit, so I decided to take an exit and pursue a passion of my art and also nonprofit world, so okay. that's where I kind of headed. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. So how was, uh, Marysville's obviously gone through a lot of changes, much like Camino. Mm-hmm. What was Marysville like for you back then? Oh, boy. Much different. A lot of what I hear here on Camino, oh, things are so different. We come to Camino and it feels like being in another world. And that's how Marysville used to be. Definitely growing up, it was a very safe uh, small town. Went to high school there and uh, have a lot of friends I'm still in connection with. And just a good place. Very good place. And it still is. It's just growing. And just like any town, it's going through pains, I'm sure. And growth is tough. Yeah. Well, in Marysville always feels like it's that weird in between like you typically don't go to Marysville you're going to Everett or Seattle or you're going like farther north but like so Marysville is just in that weird kind of like almost like pinched spot as a city yeah yeah that's true and you go through it a lot unless you're I suppose going to Boom City or right (laughs) at the 4th of July you definitely are going there yes did you did, did it feel that way when you were growing up did it feel like a lot of people just kind of passed through it or you know, I, it was my world, so I didn't really know. It was all I knew for a long time. Yeah. I lived out uh, just in one of the first neighborhoods on the reservation, Tulalip oh, Reservation. Okay. And so I went to Tulalip schools and then, of course, to Marysville Pilchuck High School. But it was it was just a good, I had a good growing up surroundings. And so, and Everett was the big town, you know, if you went to Everett <laughs> and Arlington was going to the country. So... <laughs> It's still that way a little. My, yeah. par- my parents lived there up until two years ago, and we moved them actually out here onto Camino with us. Okay. And uh, lost my dad last year, so mm. my mom is still here, but got her involved in the Camino Center. And nice. Getting her out, out into the senior population here. Nice. Yeah. Very cool. So um, you went to high school in Marysville. Um, in high school, were there, were there things that you were really interested in that you thought you were going to go into or anything like that? Oh, yeah, definitely was art. I wanted okay. to be a graphic artist or anything to do with creation, creating art. Uh, at one point, was going to go to the uh, Art Institute in, in uh, San Francisco. That, okay. That didn't quite pan out. I ended up getting married. Okay. <laughs> so staying here, having my son, which was great. And spending, like I say, the next 30 years in healthcare, which has, it was a great career. Really, yeah. really did good by me. So. Was that something you were, like, did you end up going to, like, nursing school? or? No, that? no, I was, I started out as a receptionist. Okay. Uh, and they were a great company to grow people and let people, you know, have education while they were working and kind of come up the ranks. And yeah. so that was, I was very fortunate to be able to start out as a, as a receptionist, then a reception supervisor, and then a uh, manager, and, and so it just kind of evolved, and it was a great place. Nice. Yeah. Was that something you were ever, uh, as you, did you kind of, did your career kind of just evolve with it over time, or yeah. was it something where you kind of were interested in? Or? No, it really evolved. It was just a job. It was a grown-up job at the time, you know, <laughs> and uh, while I was doing art. So I was always doing, in fact, what started for me with art was a few doctors that I had worked with wanted some faux finishes on their walls. Okay. And I thought, okay, I can do that. And so I started doing a lot of things just under the table with people I knew. And then I went to a um, 
it was a faux finish school. I did that for one course. It was like a one from start to finish. Oops. <laughs> And so I did that, and I, so I did a lot of work. I didn't become an official business with my art until 2001, okay. where uh, I actually thought, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have this as a side business. It, yeah. It's tough. Yes. <laughs> it's a tough gig. Yeah. But I still love painting, and coming to Kameno was really a good fit for me, mm-hmm. knowing that there were so many artists, and I've loved that yeah. every second of that part. Yeah. Yeah. What uh, what style of art were you really interested in? Oh, that's a good question. At the time, I was uh, the faux finishes doing walls. Uh, I love to add color. Like I can't stand a white wall. <laughs> My home looks like you know the color crayon box blew up. <laughs> so I would just paint people's house because people don't like to paint, right. and I do. I find it very therapeutic, and so I would paint walls, just paint, and then I started doing you know people's kids' rooms with characters or you know completely plagiarizing people's art uh, you know sesame street and right so yeah it just kind of evolved i just like doing anything people would bring me their shoes to paint i was painting shoes i was painting okay. sweatshirts rocks you know garden art so it really anything i'd like to do pet portraits right now i do a lot of of animals yeah so yeah nice. but i'm pretty busy so i don't i don't spend a lot of time with my my business i do have a studio and i i that's my relaxation yes. to go in there, but yeah. not much of a business right now. Yeah. Is it something you've uh, continued uh, more education and stuff as you've continued? Not with art, nope. Okay. Nope. I, at one point when the Everett Clinic was going through their merger, uh, it was suggested that I get my master's. Okay. And so I did that okay. uh, at Seattle University and... Finished that and then left. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> but Seattle University is a is a, a Jesuit school who really has a, a big leaning towards nonprofit and okay. and social justice. So that did me a lot of good in what I'm doing now. Yeah. Learning about um, how to help others is yeah. really. So then I went into nonprofit for a bit with the Children's Museum in Everett. Oh, okay. And kids. While they're wonderful, that's not where I really wanted to be. <laughs> and so uh, I was keeping my ears open, and what happened really was kind of a just a full circle moment where a, a board board work that I was on in Everett introduced me to someone here on the island, and they interviewed me when there was a executive job opening at the center here, and that's how that happened. So okay. it all everything helped yeah yeah and during that time were you living on the island yet I was yes we had moved we had been here six months uh, okay and then that happened so it was really beautiful (laughs) nice very cool so then um you were doing uh with your with your art business you also do like you've done marketing and graphic design and stuff like that was that something that just comes naturally to you or did you study some of that you know I went to Everett Community College for in and out from 85 when I graduated high okay. school until, gosh, a little bit in 2014, I think. I, okay. I was kind of just taking classes here and there, trying to get a degree and just never quite making it. Yep. And so I did take quite a few art classes in and marketing and with the idea that maybe that's where I was going. So, yeah, you know, and nice. I learned a lot in marketing. You, you know, you learn even though healthcare is different. Yeah. Kind of learned some of that there yeah. also but nice. I'm no expert for sure in marketing <laughs> <laughs> otherwise I'd be an artist full time right <laughs> well and, and you know marketing is also one of those interesting things that I mean especially in today's day and age it changes so quickly yeah and um, it's always you have to constantly constantly be marketing right it's and not it's, one time and you're done right it's not so, a set it and forget no. it it's not no. a and what maybe have has worked so great for you for 10 years now it's like every year or six months you've got to completely redo and update mm-hmm. where you're going and mm-hmm. it's yeah. just totally different yeah it's a so. moving target for sure yes yeah. yeah which which makes it an exciting field to study and and learn about mm-hmm. but from a practicality like actually executing on it is very difficult yeah yep so. i would agree <laughs> so awesome mm-hmm. so then uh when you you interviewed for the commando center and everything where uh had was that anything you had ever thought about like being with Senior Center? No. Nope. It was 
completely new to me. Uh, but I did, you know, when I was at the Everett Clinic, the last 12 years, I was working with women's health. Okay. And so there was a lot of, uh, yes, young people having babies, but there was also the elder uh, side of that with surgeries and cancers. And, and so I just always felt empathy and uh, draw towards helping women, in, in especially. But then I had a soft spot for the older people. And, yeah. and so when that was brought to me, I, I kind of, I wasn't quite sure. But once I came and, and saw the Camino Center and met some of the people, I just, it was like an instant feel like this is home. This is where I need to work. Yeah. This is my next chapter. Yeah. So. Awesome. So what was that like stepping into that then? That, that role, what was the state of the center at that time? Uh, there were some struggles and it was, it was new to me. So it was actually probably a good thing mm-hmm. that I was able to step in and the former executive director had left. And so I kind of just had to dig in and see where are we at, what's happening. And, and that was new because I had fresh eyes. Yeah. And uh, then COVID happened, of course. And so that nobody knew what to do. <laughs> <laughs> no playbook. Right. So just used our best judgment and, and followed the guidelines that were coming down and made it through. I learned how to apply for grants real quick and <laughs> how to work with government and, uh, and unemployment. Mm -hmm. which, you know, the staff has, has, there's an amazing staff there that's a core group that's been there a long time, and they all agreed to go on unemployment half-time, which was Mm. a great opportunity at that time. And so we were paying them half, and then, which was great because we could do nothing, no fundraising, no thrift store. So it was a tough, what's three years now, but it's, the first year was really, really challenging. Yeah. But it enabled me to get things kind of reset. Yeah. And start, um, maybe not start everything back the way it was because, you know, I'm a new person. I have different ideas. So started things a little differently. And within that, probably a question you were going to ask me is about the new kind of direction. Yeah. Where it uh, was formed as a senior center back in 1981, 82, I think, um, officially. It was in the 70s that it actually started. But that's the core foundation of why the Everett, or excuse me, <laughs> talked about that too much. Uh, why the Camino Center's there is that it's a senior center. And yeah. so back in 2001, I think there was a concerted effort by the board at the time to say, we need to be more to more people because we're the only major thing on the island. Yeah. So it tried to become a community center and did that for about 10 years. But that's a really tough thing to do because you've got to have things for kids, things for teens, things for young people, things for, you know, it, it's, yeah. it's tough to do all those things. Yeah. And I believe that that isolated some of the people on the island that felt like you're taking away our senior center and yeah. now you're making it for everybody. And we don't want to see little kids running around there or teenagers with basketballs. I mean, so out of necessity, really, coming out of the, the pandemic, it we needed to focus on one thing yeah. and do that well. And so we're focusing on seniors, which older adults is um, kind of the term we're trying to use. And it's been really well received, I yeah. think, that people are, they're happy to have their place back just for them. And yeah. and it's, I know it, it, it probably isn't popular with some people that it's not a community center, but there's a lot of places doing that work well yes. in Stanwood and on the island here too that are helping kids that are helping homeless that are helping feed uh, you know we have great partnerships just across the bridge so we don't need to try to do it all yes and uh, so we've really focused on senior programming senior education senior uh, older adult and it's working really well yeah we're, we're really our membership at one time was up to about 1,600 pre-COVID. Yeah. I think we got down to 200 during it. Wow. <laughs> so people just kind of felt like, well, why am I going to be a member when there's nothing there? Yeah. And we're back up into the nine. I think we're almost to 1,000 again. And so okay. things are, you know, things are happening. Yeah. So it that's, feels good. That's really cool. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, there was definitely a time period there where, like, the why wasn't what it is today. It mm-hmm. was, you know, either it was closed down or just wasn't in a good position. Mm-hmm. Um, and a, yeah, a lot of the other spaces and stuff in Stanwood weren't quite where they are now. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's some really robust nonprofits that are helping, you know, every aspect of humanity, which is, it's beautiful. I am so happy to be 
a part of all of those. Yeah. Um, with and so, it feels good to be the senior help here yeah. on the island uh, because fifty eight percent of this island is fifty five and older. Yeah. So, I feel like we're taking a good chunk of the island and getting them help. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, and and what you said about um, COVID kind of allowing you to reset because it literally shut everything down Mm -hmm. and then everyone and and I think businesses went through this as well where they got that choice of well do we want to just turn everything back on and and just go back to where we were or do we want to take this time to kind of reevaluate and really focus in on the things that make a difference yeah yeah and And that that was what exactly what we were able to do yeah. And bring things back slowly. Yes. Uh, and I think it was, it's been a little slow for some people's taste. They want to jump right back. Right. Uh, but that's, that's dangerous. And so we're really being very calculating and, and watching our books, making sure, can we do this? Can we afford this? Because we are a completely uh, nonprofit, uh, excuse me, we are run completely on our own courses. We don't have government funding. We yep. don't have um, contracts like a lot of you know, Snohomish County gets, yeah. um, I'm not crying. I'm just saying that's how it is. <laughs> Sometimes I cry, but, uh, yeah, we, we, we earn our keep. We, the thrift store is about 40 to 50, sometimes percent of what we do, which wow. is amazing. So yeah. shop at the thrift store, donate at the thrift store. And the center then has events, of course, and, uh, donations. We, we always ask for, you know, help and membership. Yeah, that's great. And um, when did, uh, uh, how did the thrift store come about? And do, I mean, I know it was before you started yes, there, but like, yes, way before. Um, it's gone through its own evolutions mm-hmm. over time. Yeah, that, that uh, was one of the first things that the ladies that were, there was a group, I shouldn't say ladies, it sounds like ladies, because when I read it, it's all ladies' names. But uh, back in 72, when these group of people started trying to get meals out to people uh, mm-hmm. on the island that were older, the first thing they thought of was how can we raise money and they started a little thrift store and so it was at the con- the old yacht club the yacht club oh. the current yacht club so okay. that was i believe i'm stating that right that was the little tiny thrift store that they started and what i've read is that at times they would buy something themselves just to have a sale for the day <laughs> <laughs> so but that's evolved and then it went into the older building that is currently the thrift store, but then a new campaign because of such popularity and need yeah. in 2017, the new building was built wow. uh, with donations. And so now it's the two buildings together and it's, it's very, very popular. Yeah. We're, we're really churning things in and out of there. Yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. Um, one of the pieces, so um, from your experience at Everett clinic, what, what was your final role there, and then how did that kind of help you transition in, in this role? Uh, my final role was the uh, clinical practice manager okay. um, of women's health, and that was um, several sites. There was Everett, the main main spot there, and then, gosh, we had satellites at Shoreline and another one in Everett, Marysville, for a while. So the growth was happening, and... Uh, what was the question? How did that? How did oh, that? Yeah. Uh, how did that kind of prepare you me for prepare me? Well, I guess probably just the empathy of people yeah. uh, and what they go through, and having so many staff too. I mean, there was like 120 people that reported to me, so you always have to kind of you have to understand where people are coming from, and yeah. everybody's different, different ages, different backgrounds, and that's that helps in any industry. Yeah, to know that everybody's going through something. So yeah. Uh, stop and think before you just assume and I think getting you know going to school helped uh you know I've learned a lot of business that I probably wouldn't have I did have budgets and I was in charge of you know a million dollar department but I had an overarching uh clinic and uh, you know I had HR I had a CEO I had now I'm all of that so it it's it's taught me a lot of what to do and not to do yeah. In my past roles. Yeah. So. Well, it, that, that was kind of where I was getting at is like you went from it's much different being a manager and where you operate now, you operate functionally as a business owner. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so like how has that kind of hap- transition mm-hmm. been for mm-hmm. you and, and yeah, things it's, like that? 
It's been hard it, it, <laughs> because I'll, I'll lay there at night sometimes and think, okay, there's nobody to go to. I mean, I have a board, but ultimately it's my responsibility if, if there's no money in the bank to run the programs and the services. So it, it's, a, it's a heavy weight at times, but, yeah. you know, I yeah. don't know. You just well, keep doing it. And, especially as you were going through, you know, through COVID and stuff like that, mm-hmm. and nobody knew what was going on, mm-hmm. uh, and trying to figure out, like what if this continues for six months? What does it look like? What if it continues for nine? Like, it yeah. kind of was that. And you didn't think. I mean, I can remember us shutting down March 6th, I think it was. And somebody said something about in June when we're still going through this. And I went, what? Right. No, no. Summer? Right. Of course we're not going to still be doing this. <laughs> Here we are three years yeah. later still having the effects. And mm-hmm. so, yeah, it's been, uh, it's been really different. It's a lot of learning. Yes. You know, you, you're never too old to learn because <laughs> yes. I am learning a lot. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I always, when I tell people, I've talked to different business owners and stuff like that. And they're like, well, how many years have you been in business? I'm like, well, technically we took over an end of 2019. Mm-hmm. But it's like, but you got to remember, like, we started right before COVID and then went through COVID. So really it's like we've been in business for like 20 to 30 years. <laughs> That's how much we've learned in yeah. that three year period. Yeah, it, it really is because you have to pivot. Like, Mm -hmm. it's just insane. Yeah. So I I think everybody feels that way. Yeah. That definitely is in some sort of business. Right. And if you've made it out through it, it, you're, you know, you're one of the lucky ones, I think, that that we're still standing and operating because a lot of people didn't. They folded. Yeah. Or they took the opportunity. Like, some people were like, Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, this is, I was already going to retire in two years. Why not now? Yeah. Yeah. It was, Yeah. So, um, so that, that's another question though, uh, is, you know, you had, you obviously had a, a large team at the, um, at Everett clinic, mm-hmm. but, um, it's a little different even still being a manager in a system like that versus you do have the final say on a lot of different things. Mm-hmm. How has that been? And how have you kind of continued to grow and expand in that area as far as man management and team management and mm-hmm. stuff like that, especially through COVID? Yeah, yeah, it's it's a much smaller team, uh, but they all <coughs> luckily know what they do so well. So yeah. they've taught me. Yeah. Because coming into a nonprofit is is a different world. Um. What else did I say about that? I just I I guess I just stay with the fundamentals of being a manager or a leader. Yeah. They're the same no matter what, and so yeah. I just kind of keep using those skills and plugging away. Yeah. Delegating has been a little hard, but I've had to Yeah. in this role because I, with, you know, literally 10 people on staff, 11 to run two businesses, it, you have to delegate. Yeah. And so it's forced me to do that, which I didn't think I was a control freak, but maybe I am because I have a hard time giving stuff away to say, do this. Yeah. And it's not because I think they can't do it well. I'm always afraid I'm going to burden them. Like they're too busy. Right. So it's a challenge and we're always kind of meeting to say, okay, are we right sized? Do we need to add someone to do, you know, these things that we're, and so it's a team effort. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. What are, what are some of those fundamentals that you have, that you have implemented or, or, or do fall back on when it comes to how you manage your team? Probably just getting their feedback. Mm-hmm. They, they're the ones, the other people are doing the job. They're in the trenches. Yes. They're doing the work. And so how, I don't know. I mean, I try to do the same things they do, but they're the ones that really, if that's their job, yeah. they know it best. So yeah. let them tell me. I yeah. don't need to be the one that always makes the decision. I mean, so probably that's what I fall back on is other people's experience. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 I think, I think that's, that's definitely... I think that's an important piece. And because I always, I tell our team, like, mm-hmm. if you're on the front line, like, we need to have the open communication channel from the front line to the top and back down again as easy as possible. Mm-hmm. Because if there's something that's not working on the, you know, at the register or on the machine or yeah. with anything or how customers interact or something, mm-hmm. I'm not going to know that. You know, I'm going to learn that way too late. Way down. too late. Yeah. yeah. That cog in the wheel. Yeah. <laughs> it's like we all need to keep that wheel moving yes. yeah mm-hmm. yeah so that's been an important piece for me of learning of like making sure that the right 
information is being passed up quickly and yeah um that way you can be dynamic and especially living through the time that we've lived yes, through it's, yes you have it's to even live. more important so mm-hmm. um so then what are some of the things that uh you know as you've turned the each piece back on what does the Camino Center do? What are all the different programs and stuff that they've started reopening and doing? So food has always been, the Meals on Wheels program has, has not stopped. Mm. So we have had that uh, nonstop other than the in-person. Uh, used to call it the congregate meals where we would have lunch Monday, Wednesday, Friday in the center. That, okay. that stopped, of course, during COVID, and it has slowly come back. Because we do partner with Island Senior Resources, which is over on Whidbey Island, and because they run the Meals on Wheels program out of our office or our kitchen. Oh, okay. So so it's a partnership between them. And so the meals were going out to people's homes during COVID, or we did pick up services. So um, that has not, that never stopped. But we're getting to where we're having that in-person lunch back so in may in may we'll be adding mondays and then in september we'll be adding fridays so we'll have meals back in person three days a week okay we're doing a lot of we're trying to do a lot of education and falls prevention which on the island what we've learned through covid is that people are in their homes a lot of them are isolated some of them have no transportation and a lot of them uh when they fall, that's kind of the start to, uh, unfortunately, not aging well. So you hear a lot when people fall, then they've broken something. So then they go to, you know, a rehab center to try to get better. And sometimes, it, you know, get better. And, mm. and unfortunately, it just kind of goes downhill. That doesn't always happen, of course. But that's, that's a big majority of falls that, okay. that happen after the age of, you know, 60, 70 years old. Yeah. They're pretty tough. Yeah. So we are trying to get behind that. How do you, how do you prevent that from happening? So we started um, an aging mastery course, which okay. is a 10-week course that teaches 90 minutes a week on one topic. So there's everything from sleep, um, healthy relationships, nutrition, falls prevention, how to make sure your home is, you know, get the rugs up off the floor and make sure you're not wearing shoes that you're slipping around in and just things that you can do on your own to help yourself be healthier. Yeah. So that has been extremely popular. We're in our fourth course of that, teaching that, and we take 20 to 25 people each time. Wow. So our goal is to get everybody on this island through that course. And we do have scholarships available. So if people cannot afford the $60, we're we're helping them out with that. Okay. So that's one of our biggest things. Out of the Aging Mastery courses came, of course, the Falls Prevention. And people said that we're in there. We can't take, like, the yoga class that we have, which also is back because it's a little higher impact and, uh, you know, a lot of people can't get down on the ground and get back up. So we started what's called SAIL, which stands for Stay Active and Independent for Life. And that is a falls prevention course that teaches balance and gets those core muscles in your legs and your arms and your, you know, stomach and back. Yeah. Helps you, the balance is what goes first when you get older and your muscles. So... It helps. It's um, it's amazing. The people that are taking it in, in just four four to five sessions, they're noticing a difference. Okay. So this is another way we're trying to be proactive in helping people not get sick, not fall, not yeah. have these things happen. Yeah. Uh, in that course, there's also financial and uh, planning for you know your your how you want to die because that's that's going to happen. We're all going to die. So yeah. let's plan for it. So it kind of takes, hopefully, the fear out of it, and, and we have people bring their kids if they want. They're older, uh, obviously, adult kids. Yeah. So that's been extremely popular and really exciting. The thing that we were asked most in COVID was, when is your adult day program going to come back, which is essentially a daycare okay. for people with dementia, Alzheimer's, memory loss. Because being a caregiver is tougher than pretty much anything I can think of. Yeah. And... Those people that used to come to our program, they lost that. So yeah. they were at home, no help, no support, no uh, respite care for themselves. And yeah. so a lot of times they get sick. So that's been one of our 
biggest goals is to get that back up and running. But of course, with COVID, we couldn't. Yeah, right. you can't have people wearing masks that don't understand masks. Yep. They rip them off. They don't want it. So that's been the last thing we've been able to bring back, but it is coming back in July. Okay. We are partnering with um, Dementia Support Northwest, who has just acquired and taken on what's called Old Friend, Old Friend, excuse me, Old Friends Club. Okay. And this was an adult day program started in Carnation, Washington, actually. Okay. And there's ten to fifteen uh, nonprofit uh, senior centers and churches that have rolled this out because it's kind of a playbook. It's a lot like what we did, but it's different because you have a network of other people that are doing it. Okay. So we're going to actually get that up and rolling in July. We're really excited. Mm -hmm. We're going to be able to take at least 12 people per day, which will be a five-hour day. Okay. And then depending on demand, hopefully we'll be able to do more days during the week. Yeah. We have... um, a lot of senior support as far as, you know, coming in and needing questions answered about housing, about food, about health care, about my partner, you know, memory loss. And um, we also partner with um, Island Senior Resources for that. They have an um, aging and disability resource person that will be in person again soon. Okay. It actually is on Mondays right now. So we'll be talking more about that in the future, about getting help when you walk in. We have all of our card players and our bridge players yes. and our music people, all the different music we have, a country music that started, a bluegrass that started. We have a um, ukulele group that's there. So these people are coming in as just a social gathering. There's no cost, if you remember. It's free. Yep. And they come in and just play together or art, do art together or sew together, read. We have a book club. So there's a lot of social things happening. Yeah. And there's been a ton of rentals. We're, we're one of the best rental places around for weddings, okay. for meetings, for memorials, um, parties, birthday parties, graduation. We do it all. So yeah. Well, it's, it's a beautiful building. It's very beautiful. I'm really lucky that I walked into <laughs> such an amazing spot. Right. So, yeah, a lot going on. We aren't doing as many events. There used to be... A big push to do a ton of events for the community because there wasn't, you know, there's not a lot to do on the island. Yeah. But it is very, very time intense for employees and we don't have as many. Yeah. And it also also is very um, expensive, you know, to put on. You have to. A lot of times you don't make any. Yeah. And I kind of took over saying, you know, we're not going to do stuff if it's not 100% our mission or breaks even or makes money because we can't afford to just completely subsidize everything we do. Right. So we're being very strategic about what we do. The auction is always going to be one of our biggest and um, funnest gala uh, fundraisers. So we will always do that in September. We didn't do the car show the last couple of years. I would like to do it again, uh, but it's not on the books for this year. Okay. But the women's expo and bingo and you know these things a 55 plus resource fair we did have that a, a couple months a month ago or so yeah and those are really popular and so we're just trying to focus on the things that that help the most amount of people for the biggest bang for our buck basically right. what what really helps people and can we pull off yeah. with with funds that we have yeah so that's a lot great. of that's a lot of that's ongoing. Yeah. Well, and that, that adult daycare thing, um, mm-hmm. my, uh, my mom in March of last year had a stroke. And so, um, I'd heard that. Yeah. yeah. So she's, you know, disabled and like the right side of her body. And, um, you know, my dad was trying to do the daycare thing for, mm-hmm. you know, not daycare thing. Daily the, care. Yeah. yeah the, to be the caretaker. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we're not all equipped for that. Right. And not just that. Like I, it's not just that you know, we're not all like most of us, I don't think are equipped for that Yeah. because of how much work and ability is, it, is yeah. involved. Yeah. And strength. It, I mean, to help people too, to yep. lift their body weight and to, and it's, it can be dangerous. Yes. You know, we don't, if you're not a healthcare worker, you haven't been taught right. how do you adequately lift somebody on and off of a, you know, a toilet or into yep. the shower or bathtub or it's, it can be dangerous. Right. And, and there's a lot of people doing it. You yeah. know, there's people in their 70s and 80s caring for their spouse. Yeah. It's scary. It's yeah. sad. So 
that's really on our forefront of um, helping people in that situation. Yes. But yeah, I, I went through this too. I think things that we go through in our personal life definitely mm -hmm. help us in our profession too. And yeah. that, that was one that definitely has made me see the light with a lot of things. Yeah. Well, and just something that most people don't think about because, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't happen to you until it does. And right. And then it changes everything. Yeah. Yep. Um, so yeah. So that's, that's a really neat program, and I'm glad that that's yes. being able to come back. Me too. So. Yeah, it's really important. Yeah. Awesome. So then um, what else um, are the things you guys are still looking at? You've mentioned a lot of different things that you guys have been hoping to kind of bring back. Are mm -hmm. there anything else that you guys are have going on? Um, gosh, we, so we have been partnering actually, instead of doing all the work ourselves, we said, let's figure out who we can partner with to help us do these things. And then we yeah. can split, you know, split the winnings with everyone and everybody wins. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we last November partnered with Sue Ryan, who is an artist on the Island and does a lot of the farmer's markets and, um, the administrative part of that, signing everybody up. And she's done that for a lot of years. So we thought, let's partner with Sue and see if we can do our craft bazaar this year because yeah. we just didn't have enough people to do it. So we did that last year, and it was huge success. And Great. she did well, and we did well, and everybody had a good time. So we're doing that again with our Afternoon with Santa, which was uh, one of the events that really took off in our 10 years of being a community center. It was yeah. an event for kids and for the community that was free. Which is still amazing, but doesn't fit in our mission anymore, really, yeah. because we're our mission is not about children. But we found a great partner in Arrowhead Ranch yeah. with the Heagles, and so we're going to see how that goes. We did it this year, and it worked really well. We're going to tweak it a bit this year and um, try to pull that off again to where we're both, you know, we both are getting something out of this as far as helping our community, yeah. but also covering our costs. And yeah. so we're, we're working together to see if we can continue the Santa event every year that people love. Um, would love to do the car show, but also probably need a, someone to help us. I'm trying to think of what else. Um, there, there used to be a big music uh, it's a good venue for music. Okay. And so having, I know there was a jazz series and there was uh, a lot of different oh, acoustic right. series and yeah. different musicians that would come, which is really fantastic. But unless you make a lot of money and have a big bar and food, you really don't make money because you right. have to pay, you know, you have to pay your musicians and all the staff. So yeah. that's been a tough one to bring back. And yeah. we're hoping that as people would like to play that they can help us or do it themselves yeah. basically use our venue but we can't do the work so yeah. there are some things that we've had to kind of say we're not able to do that anymore yeah um but but it's okay i, th I think we're yeah. we're finding ways to kind of make hopefully both parties happy yeah 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 i think i remember you guys used to do um some like big band dance thing. Those like are that. still actually going on okay. we aren't yeah. running them but uh chris chewy with the Forte, Forte, dance. Forte, thank yes. you. Yes. Yeah. His crew does that. Um, I think they put on six a year, and so we've been kind of partnering with him to provide the space. But yeah. they do all the work. You yeah. know, they, they that's their gig. They do a great job at getting the musicians in and bringing the people in, and we help by providing the space and the staff and a bar if if that's needed, and the advertising. We try to help you know get that in our newsletter and get that out. So. Rather than completely doing it ourselves, right. selling tickets, that type of thing, which is extremely time consuming, right. <laughs> we're trying to say, hey, you guys can come and do this. As long as you pay us a little rent to cover our costs, then you can do those things too. Yeah. So that's kind of how we're shifting things. Yeah. We can't do it all. Right. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think that is something we've all learned as we've made it through mm -hmm. COVID and everything is it's okay to say no and it, like we can't do everything. So yeah. what are the things we can do very well? That make the biggest impact. Yes. And focus in on those. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and let the other people do the things that they're really good at. Yeah, exactly. Um, and yeah, like you mentioned, there are a lot of really good um, other nonprofits in, in the Stanley mm -hmm. Camino area that are yeah. doing really neat things. And, yes. Um, yeah. One I've been learning more and more about as they keep popping up more is the uh, Camino St or Stanley Camino Resource Center in, yeah. in Stanley. They're doing yep. a lot to try and again, kind of be that person to be like, okay, we don't maybe have everything, but we can point you to the senior center mm -hmm. if you're going to 
you yeah. need that or the why if you're mm-hmm. looking for that stuff. And yeah. they connect a lot of the pieces. So yeah. they're yeah, and we all meet. All the executive directors of all the nonprofits in this area meet, and we talk about how how to share things and help each other. And it's it's great. It's yeah. such a good network. Well, and you need that, and because you know, I've I've been working with uh, I, I've been working with on a project with Island County, um, and you know, it is one of those things where Camino and Stanwood, we just financially. Mm-hmm population wise and everything Mm -hmm. we just fall to the bottom just because Mm -hmm. there is a larger concentration of people outside of our area so Mm -hmm. for San Juan Camino they really need each other especially the nonprofits Mm -hmm. that we don't get the same funding that people you know nonprofits would be get we don't get the Stanwood doesn't get the same funding that the you know Snohomish City or some of these other bigger pieces in Snohomish get right yeah yeah it's true and yeah it sounds like you're crying sometimes but it's it's just a fact, and, yeah. you know, we, we have other things that they don't have. You right. know, we're on an island. Yeah, yeah. We <laughs> we're get surrounded to, by water. Right, and so. we get to know all the, you know, each piece of our, uh, mm-hmm. whether it's part of our government or part of our, our system. Like, mm-hmm. you know, most people don't walk into the grocery store and see their, you know, the sheriff or the, yeah, you know, the, the commissioner. and yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or your teacher. Like, even that is mm-hmm. a really weird thing for most communities. Kids don't usually see their teachers outside of this classroom. The school, yeah, that's and true. And here, like, all of the kids see their teachers everywhere. <laughs> yeah, it's a sm- yeah, you're right. Small, small community. And yeah. That is one thing I noticed immediately when we moved here. Mm-hmm. Like, I had more friends, neighbors, acquaintances <clears throat> within, you know, three, four months than I did years <laughs> yeah. at some of my other houses in, in the big city. So yeah. uh, I love it. It's, it feels good. Yeah. Yeah. It's really cool. I really like it. All right. Well, we like to end every podcast with some rapid fire questions. Oh, so boy. the first one is <laughs> what purchase of a hundred dollars or less have you enjoyed the most in the last three months? hundred dollars or less. I would say it's a mug that I purchased this weekend, actually, at the LaConnor Fair, Art Fair, Art Bash, I okay. think it was called. Yeah, we went uh, and I splurged on a $60 mug. Wow. Yeah. Can you believe that? <laughs> but it was hand crafted yeah. uh, pottery. Oh, very cool. And hand painted. And it was just, it just spoke to me. It was so beautiful. And so I've been carrying it from home <laughs> with my coffee in the morning. I wash it and I take it to work and I have it. <laughs> So I would say that's probably the item. That's awesome. That's the one. I love, you know, I love the little things that we, we splurge on, but like they're, it just, it, it makes such a difference to us, even though they're a small thing. Small thing. Yeah. So I love that. That's when you know it's worth it. Yes. Yeah. Um, Who is the most influential person outside of your family in your life? I... I struggled with that because you kind of told me that question. So I'll tell you, this isn't really rapid fire. Uh, I would have to say um, it is somebody that's passed, actually, and her name was Jude Bullman. She was my my administrator for about 13 years at the Everett Clinic. Okay. And she she showed me, I didn't know much about being on boards or even doing nonprofit work. I didn't know much about it until I met her. She was very involved in the Boys and Girls Clubs. Mm -hmm. And she invited me to an event at one point, and it just really changed the way I thought about our place in the world. And she was just very influential. She kind of took me, I felt, I think she made everybody feel that way, but I (laughs) felt like she took me under her wing and just, she was just very special. And I lost her, we all lost her in a, Gosh, 2014, I want to say. Um, and so she, she that's her. That's who I think of. Yeah. I think cool. of her a lot. And I have artwork from that auction that we kind of had this special thing about. And I have that in my office still. So, nice. Yeah. Very she cool. follows me everywhere. <laughs> that's great. All right. This is a fill in the blank question. I know <laughs> this is weird, but I've always wanted to <laughs> blank. So it's really weird. Okay. Uh, I'm here for it. So I'm a Dave Matthews. My husband and I follow Dave Matthews' band. <laughs> nice. We're groupies. Yes. I'm, I'm bad, but <laughs> I've gotten better. It's something I've always wanted to do. I know where he lives, and so I would like to get some little kids, like not steal them, but like <laughs> if I had friends that had little kids, I'd like to take them on Halloween 
to trick or treat in his neighborhood so I could go to his door. Nice. That would be <laughs> that'd be awesome. Is that weird? I don't think oh, so. You wanted weird. I think that's great. A stalker weird. I you know, I don't know. <laughs> Cuz my kids are grown and I don't have grandkids, so how do I trick or treat? Just bring, you know, a random kid along. It's fine. <laughs> You can borrow mine. That's fine. Okay, okay. They're friendly. They'll talk your ear off. They're in back, so. Uh, my lucky wouldn't be home. <laughs> I'd be on tour or something. All right. Uh, who is an interesting or fascinating person that I should interview next? Oh, fascinating and interesting. Um, I thought I had, you know, have you have you interviewed the Fays, Jim and Susan Fay from Puget sound tree no i haven't i think they would be good one or both or mm-hmm. even uh their arborist yes who is actually going to be doing a talk at the end of the month in um april uh april 29th i believe it is at the Camino center one o'clock and he's going to do a talk on uh, the trees and stuff on an island I, we've had a lot of problems falling i know we've yes. had them out several times to the thrift store we've had them out to the center <laughs> And my home. And yep. so it, it's obvious that the, something's happening, whether it's the wetness, I, they're going to tell us. But yeah. I think they'd be interesting to talk to. I don't, maybe, I don't know. Yeah, no, for sure. I actually, I just remembered, I did interview Susan when she was the president of the, uh, uh, the chamber. chamber. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I haven't gotten Jim on the podcast. So yeah, I think I'd that would be him. interesting. People are, are, I think there's going to be a big turnout for that talk because it's, I don't think anybody has not had a tree fallen or right. coming down or looks like it's going to or yeah yeah well and it's so you know obviously uh, we have these crazy wind storms and stuff through mm-hmm. the winter and that's the other thing the wind and it's scary i mean like mm-hmm. my my brother-in-law sent me a picture of a branch that was massive that broke through their deck and i was like I if know. they had been there a kid yeah. or something like yeah. they'd be dead so it's yeah. like it's really scary because it's really mm-hmm. life or death on some of these things yeah. and, well, or, and or your house. <laughs> and it, I think every year we hear or see pictures of falling on cars. Yeah. yeah you just pray that nobody's ever there. Yeah. there. yeah. yeah. All right. And lastly, what piece of advice would you give your 20 year old self? <laughs> oh, probably like most women stop worrying about your weight and how you look because when you look back at pictures of your 20s you're like oh my gosh (laughs) I was stunning (laughs) I was so skinny I was and then but yet I remember being that age running marathons and thinking I had to do better and just more and more and more it's just sad and I don't know if that's all women but a lot of us just struggle with I don't know yeah it's not important yeah it just doesn't matter and there's more things to think of in life than how you look or, and, and I'm not opposed to feeling good if you, you know, yes. obviously health is good. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, some yeah. of that is just, it's not important. Yeah. I think people are still finding themselves throughout their twenties. And so you're always mm-hmm. comparing, but you, you don't realize that everyone else is also just comparing and they're just thinking about themselves. So they don't even have time to think <laughs> about how you look or right, what you look right, like. Right. Yeah, they're not thinking as much as you think they are about right. you. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Very cool. Well, I'm so excited that you were able to join me on the podcast today. Thank you so much. Thank you for asking me. Yeah. yeah. And Islanders, I will talk to you on the next one. Well, a big thank you to Bonnie Eckley for joining me on the podcast today, and thank you for listening. If you haven't already, be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast platform. It really helps us be found by other Islanders like yourself. And once again, I'm going to ask you, please share this episode or maybe your favorite episode of the Camino Voice with uh, any of your friends, colleagues, family members, people you like, people you don't like, uh, and tell them about the greatest little podcast focused on Camino in the Northwest. So really appreciate that. Thank you guys so much, and I will talk to you on the next one.